Okay, so let's see where we go for the next generation of equipment and in particular the challenges that we're going to be uh, uh, needing to address. So the first one that we have to deal with is the data rates. A uh, typical channel would have the uh, uh, characteristics of uh, 50 mega samples a second would be uh, quite common. Uh, we're wanting to apply swept gain uh, in the analog region uh, and then digitize it and if we do 12-bit sampling on this uh, it leads to very high data rates. So for example if we're dealing with 32 channels in parallel this is a requirement of 3.2 gigabytes per second and this will be a challenge even for the serial buses such as PXI Express. This becomes even more of a problem when you scale it up to 64 or 128 channels and these data rates of 12.8 gigabytes per second for the 128 channel parallel version uh, is certainly extreme. We also have a challenge with the number of interconnect lines and so on. Our array, the step scanned array, typically has 128 or more elements but it's probably more relevant to consider the active aperture that you're dealing with at a time. So here if we've got a transmit receive aperture of 32 elements and with exactly the same 12-bit digitizing at 50 megahertz, that involves 32 times 12 which is 384 separate tracks if you're acquiring it in parallel. This is a, a real challenge particularly at those data rates so we need to find some alternative. And the solution for that is to use serial data streams. Uh, initially this was done by the semiconductor industry for A to D converters at uh, high data rates and those use serial low voltage differential signaling outputs. Uh, largely driven by the medical market uh, these were expanded up into what's referred to as ultrasound analog front ends and here you have the uh, analog swept gain capability built into the front of it, some filtering and the a to D conversion also incorporated into the same device and typically an analog front end will include eight channels although current ones are, are dealing with 16 or more. So whatever implementation we're going to do uh, our beamformer hardware is going to have to be capable of interfacing to serial LVDS. We also need to address the requirements for flexibility and scalability so we want to make some modular hardware and it needs to be able to support all the different standard configurations pulse echo where your transmit and receive is the same uh, pitch catch where you may have separate transmitter and receiver arrays on the same side of the device on the same side of your imaging uh, uh, material uh, through transmission which is the same but where your uh, transmit and receiver arrays are on opposite sides but we also need to be able to address any requirements from conventional transducer systems which use multiple and high channel counts. In addition we've got a variety of different scan types and all of these uh, have different uh, array connectors uh, often being proprietary so we need to be able to have a system which is going to adapt to all of these. We've already discussed step scanned arrays with multiplexing if you don't have a multiplexer but use almost all the whole aperture on uh, transmit and receive for every beam then this scans through the angles uh, by providing a skewed um, delay profile. We also need to be make sure that we're capable of addressing full raw data systems as uh, discussed earlier. So we've got a variety of different uh, scan types. We also want to make sure that we're future proof and in the future we know that there's going to be a, a migration towards two-dimensional arrays which involves many more channels even if you're using sparse arrays uh, it's still going to involve many more channels that are currently available. We also want to be capable of handling sophisticated transmits such as for coded excitations. And if we're dealing with a scalability issue where we need to have multiple modules then we need to be able to uh, provide very tight synchronizing between these modules. So let's have a look at some of the options. Well the first and most logical one to go for would be what's referred to as application specific integrated circuits or ASICs. These are where you actually design directly into silicon uh, what you're trying to achieve However, while this may have the highest performance, there's a high development cost, it takes a long time to do, requires uh, um, very specialized uh, uh, design capability, 
and of course is rather inflexible because once you've committed yourself to that design uh, it's very difficult and expensive to change it and so this approach is uh, well suited to mass market uh, implementations but not really to the type of uh, flexible approach that we're looking for here. We can look at digital signal processors. These are very flexible and well suited for complex algorithms. However, one of the key things that we have here is that the algorithms aren't particularly complicated. It's just that they dealt with, uh, with a massive level of parallelism. Now, GPUs, uh, graphics processor units, uh, are available in most PCs and these incorporate multi-core DSPs. So one might think that uh, with the fact that they're um, commercially uh, widely available uh, that the cost may be low. However, we've still got to address this backplane bottleneck where we've got to get the data into these GPUs. So the third one is field programmable gate arrays. This is a, a, a massive array of uh, very small logic blocks, each of which can be customized to a variety of different capabilities. Not only that, but these logic blocks can be uh, have got interconnects, which again are programmable. And the combination of these means that you're able to implement things very s similar to application-specific integrated circuits, but uh, in a reprogrammable fashion. Indeed, many of these now have multiple DSPs embedded in them, so even if you are implementing complex algorithms, this still provides an upgrade path for that. Let's have a look at some of the benefits of FPGAs. As I mentioned, they've definitely got the flexibility, certainly over the ASICs, they're reprogrammable via software, so it's easy to do field upgrades. And they're hosted on conventional uh, boards that uh, are readily available off the shelf. They've got excellent performance. You've got uh, uh, capability of parallel processing, and in particular, the advantage is that you can concentrate the parallel processing where it's needed and just provide serial and uh, single path uh, items where um, where, the, where the data is, is concentrated into that. Uh, if you need high throughput then you can implement pipelining approaches so uh, very fast data rates can be handled and another benefit is that you can provide real-time responses to uh, stimuli so that uh, by the time you've produced an image on it you can respond to that image uh, directly within the hardware. They're extremely reliable. Part of the advantage of this is that you've got a hardware implementation of the algorithm, so it's uh, very robust. But another benefit of this is that you've got a predictable response time, even without the use of a real-time operating system. Some of the potential issues with FPGAs. Well, the hardware is, uh, is always going to be a problem. Uh, but to some extent, this has been addressed by using generic PXI and PXI Express boards and where you need to customize it, uh, the big advantage is that uh, you can use uh, an adapter module in front of the FPGA uh, to provide this customizing. On the software side, this traditionally required VHDL expertise. This is the language in which you would normally encode ASICs. But one of the uh, ways of addressing this is by using National Instruments LabVIEW FPGA Toolkit. And one of the benefits of this is it uses exactly the same data flow techniques as you use in standard LabVIEW. The benefit of this, though, is that the, is that the uh, part of the compilation actually creates and includes the VHDL compiler. Another particular benefit of LabVIEW is that the data flow structure is inherently parallel, and therefore it's extremely good at implementing the algorithms that we're looking at trying to implement uh, and in the FPGA. It's, uh, the development and simulation can be carried out in the host PC and when you're happy with the processing the, and the algorithms and these have been largely debugged you can migrate these down and load them onto the FPGA itself. And if you do have VHDL code either you need to create new code for, uh, for optimizing a very specific small part of it or you already have some existing VHDL code you can integrate this and reuse it where it already exists. So let's have a look at uh, the solution that we've taken using FPGAs with customized hardware. This was an early implementation done in the late 1990s. On the left hand side here we see a card, we see the FPGA, uh, one of the FPGAs on the card. On the left hand end of the card we can see five connectors which allow you 
uh, for a mezzanine card to be plugged into this and this provides in a direct connection to the pins of the FPGA. On the right hand side we see uh, two banks of image memory and so what we're able to do is we're able to use this as scratch pad memory. On the right hand side of the slide we see here a block diagram and on the mezzanine card we can provide all the customized hardware that I talked about before and on the right hand side you can see that you can implement the specialist uh, uh, acquisition and processing uh, code in the FPGA and pass it into the twin image memory. However, uh, unfortunately this became, uh, this, uh, the FPGA was uh, discontinued and so this became uh, unavailable. However, the feasibility of this approach had already been demonstrated. The current version of uh, this type of system uh, is shown here. On the right hand side we have, uh, this happens to be a PXI Express card, uh, it's what's referred to as a Flex Rio card, and uh, a variety of these cards are available with different uh, levels of size of FPGA, uh, including some DSPs, some without DSPs, so you can choose what you, uh, uh, what you need. In front of this, mounted onto it, is uh, the adapter module, and this particular adapter module is one that has been optimized for ultrasound imaging. Uh, it's capable of acquiring 32 channels in parallel and this is use, uses four of the AFE devices I was mentioning earlier. Uh, the AFEs themselves have got digital swept gain built into it which allows you an arbitrary swept gain profile and the ga gain range from this is minus 5 dBs to plus 31 dBs in 1 8 of a dB steps. It also includes programmable filters and is able to achieve the 12 bit 50 mega samples a second for each channel that we were looking for. And in addition to that, the, some of the remaining FPGA inputs and outputs are available for use for digital input and output. This is the system that uh, we've uh, uh, implemented. We have a PXI chassis here, and we have a card that's plugged into it on the right, on the extreme right end of the chassis. That's uh, the digital outputs and inputs to this uh, are routed through to a multi-channel. Uh, tr uh, pulser system that we already had from uh, our existing uh, uh, NTT hardware on the right hand end and this is interfaced to an array that we can see at the front.